I don't think that most people realize that that the environmental industry such as it is is actually a pretty dirty business. People sort of have like this green idea of what environmental engineering is. It kind of sort of misses the point. In the environmental space, like if you're talking to your mom or your grandma, you know, they always say, oh, you know, you're in the environmental industry. That means that you're protecting the planet or saving the ducks or something like that. And that has always made me laugh because really, you know, at the end of the day, the business that we're in is sort of a hard engineering industrial support business. And while we do probably more to effectuate the cleanliness of the environment than um, most of the people who work around things like policy, for example, no offense to them, but sort of by way of example, I have this story. So back in 2007, we were working on this remediation project. The project was focused on digging up coal ash, the ash that's the byproduct of coal being burned and it has heavy metals in it. And so at this particular uh, facility, they had taken that coal ash over the course of like 100 years and spread it out all over this property. And of course they did that, you know, we're talking back like in the late 1800s kind of thing. Um, you know, they did that in a time when, when nobody really knew what was in that stuff, didn't realize that it might be bad for you. And, you know, spreading it around like Johnny Appleseed was just what you did. So it wasn't like um, they had done anything nefarious you know, with our sort of modern understanding of of pollution and what's good or bad for people, they needed to clean this up. And one of the, or two of the big sort of components of coal ash are sometimes lead and arsenic. It was a large project and um, ultimately um, we ended up going round and round with with the local uh, environmental protection agency, um, state level environmental protection agency, um, talking about how to reasonably effectuate this cleanup. And in a lot of cases, uh, what people do is they dig it up and they put it in the back of a dump truck and they haul it off to a landfill. So, um, you know, basically taking the garbage out of your trash can in your house and putting it into the trash can on the street and then taking it to a much larger trash can, otherwise known as a landfill, which is sort of a comedy unto itself, right? So, Some of the source of the funding was coming from a state agency. And so uh, actually in that state agency got the money from the feds. So there was this requirement that we go and run our remediation plan uh, past the CDC, which is much more in people's minds now than it used to be um, to sort of talk about, you know, whether or not what we were doing was, was really going to positively affect human health. Because that's what the CDC of course is really concerned with. The CDC said basically, look, it, you know, it's it's coal ash and but no, nobody should be eating it because it's not really good for you. Um, but, you know, if you put six inches of clean topsoil on top of it and you plant grass um, and then you have like a maintenance plan, an O&M plan, that's probably fine. Well, the, the local environmental agency uh, completely disagreed with that and, you know, waived their own regulations around about what was required. And... Um, at the end of the day, the only way to sort of get to compliance with the, the with the local environmental uh, protection agency, being very coy here, trying to protect the relevant regulatory body, but um, they required that we dig it up and dispose of it. So obviously, you know, you would think that the federal government and the way that they see it might supersede what you know a state or municipality thinks. But in this particular instance, that wasn't the case. And so notwithstanding the CDC's written recommendations about what we should do, the local environmental uh, protection agency decided to take it all the way to, um, you know, the end point of their regulations, which required that we dig it up. So in the end, we ended up digging up 150,000 yards of material. That runs out to about 10,000 dump trucks. We hauled 10,000 dump trucks of dirt from this site to the next state over and disposed of it in a landfill. 10,000 triaxles, 10,000 dump trucks belching all of that diesel fumes and exhaust and everything else into the air here in the Northeast where air quality has been an issue for a long time, most people know that, in the name of protecting human health and the environment. And I always thought that that was just absurd, especially when you have an agency like the CDC saying, look, it's really okay if you just kind of cover it over and, you know, you put six inches of topsoil on top and you just leave it. And as long as nobody eats it, it'll be fine. Nope. Instead, we sent 10,000, I'm not even, I'm not even exaggerating, 10,000 dump trucks, dump truck loads of this material to the next state over to put it into a landfill. And there's just no objective 
engineering mathematical metric by which you can measure that effort and walk away with the conclusion that what we did to satisfy environmental protection regulations did anything but make the planet more dirty. The reason I tell that story is because I think that that's the first time that it sort of entered my frontal lobe, that a lot of the work that we do in this business in the name of environmental protection is not that. It's more compliance with regulation. And sometimes regulations are not built around, you know, best intentions. They're not really built around the better idea of what really constitutes environmental protection or cleanup or human health or whatnot. It's just driving at a regulatory endpoint. That got me thinking about this business in general and what we really do and how we should really think about how we effectuate cleanups. Cleanups should be approached in a very holistic manner. And if we're really interested in saving the planet and protecting human health, then all of the various stakeholders and inputs and whatnot should be part of the conversation when we figure out how we're going to clean up a site. And they're not. I think that there's a tremendous amount of space in these environmental businesses, he says with a snicker, around ESG programs. Because I think we sometimes are the worst offenders when it comes to really approaching this in a holistic way. And that project kind of turned me in this direction. And it's been a long time coming because here it is now, 2022. But, you know, 18 years ago or so, that really got me thinking about this. Welcome to 312, the HRP podcast. I'm joined today by Dan Titus, CEO of HRP, Jackie Baxley, the EHSNS practice leader at HRP, and Alicia Washington, Director of Marketing, Jedi, and DEI at HRP. And I'm Tom Simmons. Today, we're talking about ESG. Jackie, can you tell us what ESG is? So ESG is an acronym for E, environmental, S, social, and G, governance. And um, it really all falls under the umbrella of sustainability. And, and there are many people, when they hear the word sustainability, they're probably thinking of, you know, tree hugging hippies and recycling and bees and bunnies and things of that nature. Um, but, but I would argue that that is the old school definition of sustainability. And that is not what um, the business community um, at large really views sustainability sustainability anymore. Sustainability, you know, the UN defines it as meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Notice it just says needs. It doesn't say anything about, you know, the environmental, the environment resources or anything. And it really compromises three pillars, economic, environmental, and social. So when you hear ESGs, um, people are essentially talking about a holistic sustainability program. You know, sustaining our environment, sustaining our social or human capital, as well as sustaining our business at large. Alicia, from uh, your perspective, kind of a overview approach, where do you see DEI as being a part of sustainability or ESG? So the uh, the social aspect, so the S in ESG, is really where DEI uh, plays the the most significant role. Um, you know, unfortunately. Um, the social part of a sustainability program um, is one of the most overlooked aspects in developing your sustainable strategies. Uh, so it's really where, um, you know, companies need to work on treating their employees fairly, promoting no discrimination policies, supporting fle flexible working hours, investing in local communities, um, implementing fair wages, ethical sourcing, understanding the supply chain, and so on. So all of those things really kind of cover the social aspect um, of ESG. And so um, a lot of what goes into building a very strong ESG program has a lot to do with the stakeholders in the company and really kind of having everyone involved. And the more people you have involved, the better your strategies are going to be. So when we talk about sustainable development and the goals therein, we see a, a pretty comprehensive list of what those goals could be from poverty to eliminating hunger, good health and well-being, things like quality education and gender equality are included as well. 
you see that in conjunction with things that might be uh, more readily apparent when we talk about sustainability, such as climate action, uh, life below water, life on land, affordable and clean energy. Uh, how do we see these goals reflecting HRP's uh, internal practices? Yeah, so, you know, depending on where you splice in Dan's story for those, yeah, <laughs> depending on how this ends up getting cut, the story Dan just told or the story Dan's about to tell, um, yeah, the the environmental practice as a whole, we've had this weird relationship with with sustainability um, and, and this weird relationship, if you will, um, where we're normally uh, tailoring to, to industries and dealing with regulations sometimes that might have you know, sound environmental um, outcomes associated with them or, or not. Um, so when you're looking at the the UN 17 goals for sustainability, sustainable development, which is what you were referencing, um, as an environmental health and safety company, engineering company, you know, remediation and, and environmental company, um, we we find ourselves on, on kind of both sides of the coin of these goals. Some of them were helping our clients meet their goals because of the practices that that we employ, um, because of the services we provide to our clients. So that could be, you know, we help with, you know, you know, energy uh usage, for example, or, or, or energy resilience, um, because we conduct energy audits. We also help um, site and provide the foundational infrastructure for solar farms. Um, we also help folks with water and wastewater treatment technologies, as well as pollution prevention. So when you're looking at the goals, there's the, the portion that just as the nature of what we do, we're assisting the, the communities in, in meeting their goals. Um, and and that, that really goes across all of our practices, engineering, environmental, and, and compliance. I think what's kind of important, so from 100,000 feet from my chair here, right, what's really important to understand about this and kind of keys into the story that I was telling before, which obviously doesn't get to all aspects of ESG, but it's just sort of a, a narrative about um, how all this stuff sort of interplays. The idea that, you know, you could be doing something in the name of, um, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion, or in the name of social justice, or in the name of environmental cleanup, or in the name of sustainability, with all the best intentions, not really considering all the potential ramifications of the action that you're taking, and what the downstream, if you will, consequences might be, or what the negative side effects might be. And when you're talking about ESG, because it's really kind of like a global issue, we're talking about, um, you know, not to be particularly dire here, but, you know, as population grows and people continue to consume resources and back to, um, I think it was the UN definition of what uh, um, um, sustainability is, Jackie just gave her ESG uh, that Jackie gave is, you know, it's about conservation. It's about protecting future generations and all sorts of stuff. So it's it's a very complex uh, web that's interwoven across all these different spaces, which is why, you know, things like economics come into this. And, you know, in a company like this where, um, you know, we're going to be so clearly involved in these sorts of um, wrench turning aspects of, of achieving these things for industrial clients and so on and so forth, given the fact that it's so complex and it has so many permutations and it's so difficult to sort of think through, um, you know, like I said before, the downstream consequences of what you think is the, is the right path or the right action in this moment, but maybe you don't think about what it means in 10 years kind of thing. It seems to me that for us, what we really need to do is we kind of need to live it first. Like we need to do it internally. Like we need to figure out how it works for us because if we're going to, step out into the world and, you know, make a living of advising people um, how to do this, which I think is, you know, kind of what we're talking about long term. I think we got to live it first. I mean, nobody wants a financial advisor that can't make money in their own portfolio, right? So, um, you know, I think a lot about what we're talking about here is how we're, we're figuring out how to do this in a meaningful way for ourselves so that we can help other people do it. Alicia, what are the um, ESG goals that are kind of most relevant at the moment or most current for what you're working on? And what are some of the ways that we've uh, looked to achieve those goals? HRP started 
uh, its Jedi program uh, last year. And um, a lot of what is involved with the social aspect of ESG is really about taking care of your employees. You know, sustainability relative to everything that we're talking about, moving the company forward and, um, you know, or con- conservation and, you know, making everything great for the next generation, Um you know, it really has a lot to do with how can we be, how can we take um, our company right now, the employees we have and the employees we will have, and make them um, the best they can be, which is also going to make HRP the best company it can be. And so with doing that, there's a lot that goes into um, having a DEI program within your company that supports your employees and creates a safe space for them. Um, we know that employees operate at their highest level when they feel safe um, in their workplace, when they feel like they can share vulnerabilities and, um, you know, be able to take risk with certain projects, knowing that there won't be any repercussions for that. They can come to work being their authentic selves. And we've also noticed that, you know, with a lots of empathy coming even from the leadership, when there's more empathy, empathy from leadership, we've noticed that, there's better decision making. Um, you know, by having the Jedi program, we're basically creating groups and creating spaces for people to talk, for people to um, strategize on different things that are going to make the company better. Um, we are excited to uh, have our HRP women uh, group that's going to start um, very soon. And we're looking forward to hearing lots of great ideas coming from that that employee resource group. Um We know that from when it comes to creating something like sustainability, right? But if you think of any other kind of initiative a company will have, the more people you have on board with that mission, the better it's going to be. And so when you create an environment within a company where, you know, you're getting a lot of buy-in, everyone's involved, people feel like, you know, I'm here, they see me, I'm being heard, they're going to help bring that initiative forward. And so we know that by incorporating a lot of um, activities and ways that, you know, employees can be involved in things when people see that, you know, there's a lot of opportunity for me here. Yes, they're listening to my ideas and, and I'm involved with this and they're listening and hearing me. We know that they're going to be involved in creating these strategies that help specifically with something like sustainability because it's not something that we pick up and put down. I mean, this is something that we have to work on forever. Um, and so we want to make sure that all the employees feel like, you know, their voice is being heard and they can be involved. We want them to be involved in something uh, as big as this. Um, But it goes for any other kind of initiative we would have. So it's really just about bringing the employees in and making sure that they feel comfortable here, that it's a safe place to work. It's a great place to work. um, And we're going to see a lot lot of progress um, from from those employees. Yeah. And if I can kind of, you know, just piggyback on on that as well because a huge part of the the social side of a sustainability program um, is also employee health and safety and and you know Tommy asked me earlier where do our practices kind of overlap with some of these goals um, you know health and safety is obviously something that we've done for 40 years you know here here at HRP and and a lot of the process that Alicia just talked about about engaging the employees, listening to their concerns and their needs, responding, and and really making sure that we get that buy-in. You know, where where her perspective was was very much from from our Jedi program, but but that's a health and safety program as as well. Um, you know, a health and safety program at its fundamental core is that you care for the health and safety of your employees. <laughs> you don't want people to get hurt or injured on the job. You want them to bring to you any health and safety concerns and then you respond to those concerns and you ensure that you build a, a safer workplace. And 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 so the health and safety aspect is is as much a part of our ESG program, you know, as as Jedi is, as governance is, as, you know, you know, our, our support of local education, of our support of our communities and food drives. Um, it's it's all a part of, of, of that network. And it really just, 
you know, it's it's a really interesting space to be in, you know, where, where we've really taken a, the approach from the compliance side where we're dealing with the regulations and, and we're now really taking this more holistic perspective of not only complying with the regulations, but what are the upstreams and what are the upstream and downstream, you know, influences and, and how can we leverage those just for a more holistic, you know, approach that takes into consideration not just what thou shalt do in the regulations, but what we should do. And I also want to mention, too, about the JEDI program, and we talk a lot about the employees, the overall community here um, at HRP, but leadership um, plays a significant role in the JEDI program. You know, the fact that we have a JEDI program and our leadership agreed that this is something that we need, that's a step that a lot of companies are not even taking and haven't even gotten to yet. So um, leadership is, uh, the leadership of the company plays a significant role here because um, they need to understand holistically, right, of what's going on with the staff and in the communities that we work in. We notice that leadership who has a significant DEI training and, and, and again, having a JEDI program within your company where you're working and, and constantly listening to your employees and hearing different experiences, you just you start to make more conscious de- decisions. You start to have more cultural intelligence. And those are things that you need when you're making these sustainable strategies, when you're building those sustainable strategies for the future is you have more perspective. Um, One of my favorite things, um, and this is just from personal experience that I love about ESG and the social aspect is the more diverse teams you have, the more those teams make more bold decisions. Um, they're, They're more likely to make a bold decision than a homogeneous team. And so um, that is extremely true. That is very true. It's from my own experience I've seen that. And so in these times, this is where we are, where we have to be, you know, making these, you know, almost risk-based in in a way uh, decisions because we're trying something new, right? We don't want to be where we used to be. We're trying new things. And so to have leadership there to support um, these types of initiatives and understand where not only the stake stakeholders, the company stakeholders, but also the communities are coming from is key in making all of this work. Yeah. I mean, um, this is another sort of curiosity in this particular industry, but, um, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that I'm Alicia might even be able to quote statistics here. I don't mean to put her on the spot, but, um, you know, the, the A and E space is very white and very male and, um, even, you know, relative to other industries out there and, you know, the national economy, the global economy, um, it is very white and very male. And it's been that way for a long time. The truth is, um, you know, here at HRP in particular, I mean, nearly half the staff at this point is female. Um, and you know, I don't know how, like as a business, just from a strategic perspective, I don't know how you can envision yourself, you know, engaged in the conversation about the future, you know, ESG sustainability, you know, social justice, all that sort of stuff that, that backs into these, these very important programs coming from a very male, very white sort of industry. Um, so just from a strategic perspective, you know, it's just simply recognizing that that's just not where the world is anymore and trying to move, you know, to keep up. I think, you know, for HRP, at least, it's a it's a, a competitive advantage because I think maybe we were, as Alicia sort of noted, we've come to that realization maybe a little faster than some of our competitors, which um, we'll take to the bank all day long. Um, but, you know, that's really what it is. It's just sort of recognizing, you know, what's in front of you and and then recognizing what's the next step after that. And it doesn't probably look like me. And that's just the truth of it. We've not really covered the governance aspect, but Dan can probably highlight a lot more on that. To me, the, the governance part of of an ESG program, which is it really, it moves around a lot depending on where you are, like what industry you're in, the size of your company, all that sort of stuff. But, you know, when I look at the governance part or the governance ideas or the governance requirements. Um, to me, it's kind of like uh, the management level of our JEDI program. Um, the JEDI program is um, 
more focused on, you know, internal staff management and recruiting and staff development and all of the things that Alicia has already very uh, adeptly covered. Um, but the governance part of these kinds of programs is like, it's like the 100,000 foot part of, of a JEDI program to me. It becomes all encompassing relative to both internal and external stakeholders. In that way, it's sort of a, it's sort of, um, like I said, it's sort of like the management end of a, of the Jedi program. It's not training. It's not, it's not leadership per se, but, um, focusing on how the company engages with various stakeholders and communities and how, you know, we roll that out and how, um, you know, we communicate that across broad audiences, how we, how we, tune those communications for different audiences, depending on, you know, what the need is, say basically a, a client request versus an internal communication. It's the, it's the, it's the process management of that. To me, that's what governance is. And then uh, sort of setting out goals and objectives in that space to sort of uh, deal with your deficiencies and make sure that you do that on a repetitive reviewable, honest basis so that you're always sort of working towards that next level or that next ideal. That's to me, that's what the governance part of it is all about. Yeah, I agree with that. And the structure, the the structure around that, that leadership, that management team. And, and that's where, you know, the, the, again, the social stuff gets sprinkled into that too, because there's, you know, data that shows that more diverse um, boards, and things of that nature, those larger groups um, are, you know, I think it's 43% more profitable um, than, again, uh, teams that are homogeneous. So um, the structure uh, uh, with the governance um, is there's some DEI stuff that falls into that too, where, again, you're just seeing better results, better ideas, better management. Um, again, back to the the thing I said before, you know, being able to have um, those tough conversations when there is an issue, you know, people just, again, when you have a, a team that uh, comes from a lot of different backgrounds, a lot of different experiences, they just, they're, they're more prepared to have those very important, sometimes confrontational, um, you know, conversations that need to be, that need to be had in order to, to um, have that fair governance. And, you know, I look at governance as, as essentially the method of how we make decisions, um, you know, we don't make decisions in a vacuum. Um, we engage our stakeholders, um, sometimes internal as well as external stakeholders. Um, you know, the the company um, has really expanded um, not only the group of, of shareholders um, now referred to as principals, as well as the engagement with that group. And so that's a, a foundation in the decision making process. And, and also ensuring that, you know, we're making decisions that based on the greater good, as opposed to, you know, benefiting just a few. And and I think it merits, I'm assuming this is not double top secret. Um, I think it, it merits even a conversation about um, what we recently presented in our annual planning meeting of, of a few weeks ago about the value statement that HRP is drafting. And it's not the board of directors that's drafting the value statement. It's not Tad and Dan that's drafting the value statement. It is the employees of the company that are drafting the value statement. And and so again, that all to me, that that all ties into, you know, that decision making, that that engagement you know, relative to how we're running a, a company. When it comes to leadership and, and the value statement and whatnot, like I, I guess, I don't know. Um, you could either, you could take this two ways, I guess. I, I either have a very old world view of what leadership is, or I have a very um, narrow view of what leadership is. Um, to me, and I, you know, for those who don't know, I, I have a bit of a military background, which you can take with a grain of salt, but to me, leadership is about service. And I'm, I'm, I'm the guy that's sort of given to, you know, the buck stops here kind of ideas and that, um, you know, crap rolls uphill and, you know, the responsible party is always the person that, you know, is the next step up and all that sort of stuff. Um, so I, I think, I think that's a very traditional idea of leadership, but I also feel like in, in, um, today's environment, that's really changed. Like, I don't, I don't feel like a lot of people understand that anymore. That's just my personal humble opinion on, on this, but you know, you look at 
a lot of the stuff that's happening out there in the world right now, um, you know, today's January 6th, um, you know, accountability at the leadership level is something that has sort of been lost in the last, I don't know, decade or so. At least that's how I feel. And, you know, uh, running a company, running a business isn't supposed to be about you. When I say you, I mean, you know, me, right? Like it's not supposed to be about yourself. It's supposed to be about all of the other things. And so, you know, you have this, you know, the real challenge of it is how do you, how do you serve all the stakeholders all of the time? Um, and sometimes that means not serving a particular population of stakeholders to the detriment of another and trying to help people understand why, you know, community-based decisions sometimes are more important than individual-based decisions, even if that means the individual has to give a little more. Like you get into these crazy sort of uh, loops in your head. But at the end of the day, you know, the idea behind the value statement is principally that the value statement should be the metric by which the leadership is held accountable for management decisions. That's, that's ultimately where um, I'd like to see the value statement end up. And um, I think that a lot of people think that, um, you know, Tad and myself in particular are kind of crazy for taking our hands off the wheel here, but that's very intentional um, because I think it gives, um, you know, the, the, the stakeholder population, the people here at HRP, an opportunity to articulate in a very clear way what their expectation is for how this firm is going to operate. And based upon that expectation, as stated in our value statement, I think that that's the thing that its leadership should be working towards on a daily basis, you know, to live up to that expectation. And I think if we can, if we can do that, um, it's not going to be easy, but I think if we can do that, we've really accomplished something. I don't know how you measure that. I don't know how you, I don't know how you represent that externally, but in, you know, my drive to build, you know, this highly proficient, you know, very expansive, um, highly enterprised, valuable, um, entity where it's employee based. Our, our, our company is nothing but its employees and it's always been that way. Um, it's very, very important that, um, you know, leadership is, is held to account for the decisions that it, that it makes on behalf of the people that are affected by those decisions. It's that, that is in many ways, that's what government governance is all about. And, um, you know, in a private company like this, we're not elected. Um, that's not how it works, you know, unlike a, you know, a bad representative in Congress that you can vote out if you don't like what they're doing. That's not how it works. So in a lot of ways, I think, especially in small private businesses, medium sized private businesses, it's very easy for its leadership to become, um, myopic and self-consumed because there are little consequences for downstream decisions. And I think that that's not the best way to run a business. I don't know that that's really a revolutionary idea. I think it's actually an old idea. I'm, I'm bringing back the sexy. I don't know. <laughs> that's a song, right? Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> you know, uh, Tom, we've, we've talked about the, the, the S and we've talked about the G. Um, if I can go to the E for, for a moment, um, you know, it, cause this isn't, to me, this is an interesting one, right? Because we are, an environmental compliance and engineering firm. Um, and so so the E, the environmental part of an ESG, we're really taking a different look. Um, you know, obviously there are the practices, the services we provide our clients, which would definitely fit under that E, but but we're we're looking internally at our own practices. I mean, we're a consulting company. We're not using you know, hundreds of thousands of gallons of water or millions of gallons of water. We're not using tons and tons of energy. We're not manufacturing anything and and thus have some type of, you know, air emissions associated. But but we have, even though we we are a consulting company, a traditional, you know, service provider, um, we have taken the effort of of calculating what are our greenhouse gas emissions, what what are our carbon emissions. And, and we, we started that process by really looking just first at our corporate headquarter location in Farmington. It was our biggest office um, where we had the most kind of going on. And, and we, we calculated our, our carbon emission. Um, those of you that are listening that 
are you know involved in in emission calculations along these lines there's what's called scope one scope two and scope three and 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 we've evaluated our scope one and scope two emissions and and now we're folding in all of our offices in into those calculations and once we're able and once we've quantified those and we track those then we're able to look for opportunities for for improvement and, and so that's not something that a traditional office would ever even consider calculating. Because, again, we're not drive past any of our offices. You're not going to see stacks. You're not going to see wastewater discharges. We're, we're office parks. Um, but, but we're still recognizing that there are opportunities for us to improve, you know, even at maybe the smallest level. And, and a big goal for us in 2022 is to not only expand that tracking to all of our offices, um, but also start the really um, complicated, I guess you could say, or complex is probably a better word, process of identifying what scope three emissions we want to um, identify, track, and 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 try to to reduce. You know, these are services that we provide our clients as well. Um, but we're we're sent we're we're turning an internal lens to, to look at where we, we can adopt those. And, and another kind of exciting part, I think, of our internal program is, you know, we've, yeah, there's a phrase that you'll hear in HRP all the time. We've been doing brownfields since before they were called brownfields. Yep. Um, and, and what I think is really exciting is um, within the company, we have seven brick and mortar offices. We have several other presences where it's individuals that might be working out of their homes, um, but we have seven brick and mortar offices, you know, where we have multiple employees reporting to a physical office location. Two of those seven are currently located in former Brownfield sites, so Brownfield redeveloped sites, yep. cleanup sites, with a third one coming online in um, summer of this year, summer of 2022. So that is that is almost 50% of our offices that are on former contaminated sites. I mean, if that's not practicing what you preach as a remediation <laughs> company, I, I, I don't know what is. I, I think that's that's really exciting. It also helps that these former brownfield sites are also some of the coolest sites out there. That's where you find the breweries. That's where you mm-hmm. find, you know, the axe throwing places. That's where you find the 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 music amphitheaters. Um, so it doesn't help that those also happen to be some of our coolest offices. Jackie makes a, a great point, and that's kind of what I mean by, you know, sort of living, living what we're preaching here, walking the walk, you know, the brownfields thing has always sort of made me chuckle a little bit because, you know, back to downstream consequences in my original story, you know, reusing buildings, meaning, you know, brownfield cleanup and restoration doesn't really fit in the larger conversation about energy efficiency and building health and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, lead certification was a thing that was out there. I think it still is, although it, it's not, it's not the shiny new thing that it used to be, but it was a while where everybody was running around building new buildings, you know, and getting lead certified because it was energy efficient and, you know, so on and so forth. And that's great, but nobody ever really stopped to measure what the energy inefficiency is in or the resource inefficiency is in building a new building versus rehabbing one that already exists. There used to be a phrase way back, I think, in the 80s when recycling first became kind of popular reduce, reduce, reuse, recycle, right? There's a lot of value in not building new stuff and taking old stuff and making it better and reusing it. And, you know, ESG programs, you know, I think really in their, in their grandest design are looking at those kind of ideas and asking questions about whether or not having, you know, two more R value in a wall because it's new construction and you can get the best new insulation really has a cost benefit from um, an environmental footprint relative to reusing some old brick building that was built a hundred years ago that you can repurpose and reuse for something else. Um, There's definitely a, there's a calculation there and there's a trade-off and a lot of, you know, well-meaning uh, practitioners or people who are interested in these sorts of things don't really work through those details, and yet they're extraordinarily important. And sort of another example, just sort of key off what Jackie was talking about, yes, it's it's very difficult to, f- to find, measure, and, and make hay with some of the metrics that are, that are, are 
you know, sort of at play here when you talk from an, an office perspective. It's not as hard a thing to go out and look at a manufacturing operation, like Jackie just said, that's got smokestacks because everybody can go, hey, maybe we should look at the smokestacks because that's relatively obvious, right? But if you're talking about an office environment, it's a lot more uh, nuanced and the, 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 uh, the opportunities are not as obvious. But at the end of the day, you know, we all have a contribution to make here, all of us. Right. So if we're not willing to do the hard work internally to sort of figure out where we can make an impact, it's kind of silly for us to go out and lecture everybody else about how they can make an impact. Right. So I just wanted to to tag on to this from, again, the the social aspect. So when we're talking about um, creating new things or you have people who have always always done the design this way or, you know, I've always done it this way. And you're trying to get people to get on board with trying something different. Um, what's, what's really important about, again, having a DEI program in your company is that you have to be able to communicate with a lot of different people on a lot of, on a lot of different things. And when you have that rapport with your employees that again it's not just about managers to to junior staff or you know maybe just your your regular co-workers that you see every day there's a lot of people in the company that you you never see and so by creating these a DEI program that really kind of brings everyone together and allows for you to have these really important conversations about sustainability or or any kind of conversation it really kind of breaks the wall down between people and allows people to really listen and hear and understand why these things are important and why we should um, be doing it this way versus the way we used to. And so it's really important to to be able to communicate with not just the employee, again, the stakeholders, but, you know, understanding what work are we doing, you know, outside of these walls? What work are we doing and how is it impacting the communities that we're doing that work in? And again, having our managers who are, you know, boots on the ground in these communities, understanding the the negative or positive impacts in those communities. And so the more conversations that we have within the company about cultural differences, um, certain neighborhoods in certain areas where we have projects, um, so many different things that we can talk about where, again, you're building that cultural intelligence, you're building more empathy uh, for things that you never considered before. It just makes you a better leader. It makes you a better manager. It makes you a better worker, a better person to just have that other perspective um, and that really helps um, with programs like this and pretty much everything. And, you know, even from uh, assisting our clients as well, you know, our clients face environmental justice issues, whether it's because of the physical location of some of their operations or maybe routes that their traffic might go through, or like you were talking about, if we're working on a remediation site, you know, environmental justice, it, I, I, I feel that as we continue to focus on that that social understanding, that social empathy internally, then that's only going to help us, you know, help our clients through, you know, these the these topics. And and what you were saying, Alicia, I was I was just thinking about environmental justice issues, and and you know, so much of environmental justice is having empathy. You know, and, and, you know, it's, it's, and, and I really look at our D, if I could, if I could probably summarize, you know, being, not being the leader of the DEI program like you are, but, but, but being a, a participant in, in our program, you know, like, like everybody else in HRP, you know, if I could put it into one word, I think it's just empathy is, is, is really what, what it's all about. And not only will that make us better consultants, but in the end, it will make each of us better people as well. Thanks for joining me, everybody. Uh, And I will talk to you all again soon. Thanks, Tom. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Play Hard section. Now, uh, if you're just coming over from the Work Hard section... And you are on the audio only portion. Wanted to let you know that play hard sections are now video sections as well. If you want to watch those, 
head over to our YouTube channel and look for the time code on the video for this episode. So I'm joined today by Brian Bolio, better known as Bubba, who is now my counterpart in the digital uh, what is this digital media marketing arena? Help me out with a lot of stuff. Yes, I'm I'm Tom Scofer, and this is the Sustainability Podcast. So, and no one. At the company, is probably sustained longer or in more ways <laughs> than Bubba here. So, uh, Bubba, why don't you tell us a little bit about your history here at HRP? Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so, I started at HRP in March of 1986. Uh, I was 17 years old. I was still in high school. Um I was uh, going to Goodwin Tech in New Britain, uh, and I was taking machine drafting. And um, one of the kids in the class uh, got a chance in an interview uh, with HRP. It was back then the CAD department consisted of Mike Peck, and that was it. Mm. Um, so Mike wanted somebody to help him out. So he uh, he actually had one of the students. He contacted Goodwin Tech and had the drafting teacher um sent over one of his students, and um, so the kid went over and interviewed with Mike, and Mike offered him the job. Mike offered him the job, and then and the kid turned it down. Mm-hmm. And he, uh, it was because he didn't have a car, and Mike said, you had to have your own car so you could go do errands uh, for the company. So the teacher came back and said, does anybody else want to go interview? Um, so me and another guy went, and... Uh, Mike ended up offering me the job, so I started when I was still in high school, um, and uh, I've been here ever since. Mm-hmm. I, I started in 1986, March of 1986. Mm-hmm. I was still in high school, and uh, I, I've grown up in the company, Yeah, basically. No, really? Uh, no, I haven't really. <laughs> no, not that, that much. Not too much. <laughs> not as much as I should have. <laughs> Cheers. Um <laughs> But it's, um, yeah, so I've, I've pretty much done everything, mm-hmm. um, you know, besides, uh, aside from word processing, I, I never did really, I never typed up reports or anything. Mm, I don't think you're missing much there. But I've been out um, surveying, I've been out, I never was out drilling, but I mm-hmm. sampled a ton of wells, I bailed wells, I, um, I don't think like we I ever said, did actual drilling. I think we just kind of were there. While it was going on, yeah, you know, we had, HRP would have somebody there with yeah monitoring the drilling, uh-huh. yeah, and we still do that occasionally, you know, putting holes in the ground. Mm-hmm. But um, so I am, and I've always uh, been in the drafting department, and uh, at at one point, geez, I don't know, maybe ten, fifteen years ago, Mike Peck. Uh, kind of moved over to the IT department because mm-hmm. uh, he was the only guy, like, setting up the computers and everything anyway. Yeah. Um, so he became the IT department. Um, and uh, so I took over the drafting department, and we had people come in and, you know, um, at one time, we like, we had, like, three people working under me, mm-hmm. which was, you know, Pretty wild, but we couldn't sustain the. We couldn't keep the workload up. Yeah. Um. So, we were drafting. We started out. We were drafting on a, on a drafting board using ink on mylar. You know, this is all like mm-hmm. <laughs> everybody talks about <laughs> the way they did it in the old days. Well, th- we did. I mean, we did it back back then. We did it that way. Mm-hmm. Um. But uh, yeah. Now it's uh, it's everything's computerized. It's all uh. Now I also do GIS and uh, and I'm helping you out, mm-hmm. you know, um, finding ways to help the company. Yeah. Um, I I but I've done everything. Like I said, I I cleaned. Uh, I like unplugged toilets. I plumbing. <laughs> I uh, yeah. You are the go to when there's Clean something up. wrong with the plumbing here. Yeah, it's always kind of been that way. Mm-hmm. But that's what Mike used to do. You know. Yeah. So Mike. Was the guy that took care of the building, and that's so I ended up 
following in his footsteps and mm-hmm. so yeah. so we mentioned uh Mike Peck a couple of times um and he's kind of so much of a legend around here that he almost goes without needing introduction but for people who may be joining us out there can you tell us more about who Mike was or I guess is uh and kind of what he means to you Yeah so um Mike Peck was the second uh, official HRP employee aside from the three original owners. And the three original owners were uh, John Hausman, Joe Rinaldi, and Mark Pazzadento. Mm -hmm. And um, they, uh, you know, when they incorporated, um, they they only had a couple of employees um, that they brought on. Uh, There was uh, Debbie D'Amico and there were Mike that was Mike Peck. Um and actually Mike ended up marrying Mark Pasadento's sister. Mm-hmm. Um so he was working for his brother in law, which, you know, he at times it was rougher on the holidays. Yeah. You know, having your <laughs> boss sitting there giving you crap. But um anyway, so Mike was like he he was here from the beginning and uh he hired me as a 17-year-old, and, you know, he was kind of like a surrogate father mm-hmm. to me. He was, obviously, I worked for him for forever, um, but uh, one of the biggest, uh, one of the biggest reasons I have so much affection for Mike is uh, um, back in uh, 2007, back at the end of 2006, um I got diagnosed with cancer, mm-hmm. and uh, Mike right away, like, became my advocate. He came to every oncologist appointment with me. He brought a notepad. He would take notes. He would um, look stuff up on, on the computer when he got back to figure out what we could do. He, he like, you know, like I said, he was like my surrogate father. Yeah. And... uh and then when I relapsed and it was determined that I, I would have to go to uh, get a stem cell transplant, um, Mike took me up to Boston um, for a bone marrow biopsy at uh, Tufts uh, Medical. Tufts, uh, I don't remember the exact name, Tufts University yeah, Medical Yeah, the Tufts up there. Yeah, I, I know the one. Uh, Mike took good care of me. Mm-hmm. And, and uh it's it's funny he he told the story recently um, when we had a, a get together here. Um, Mike brought me up to Dana Farber on the day that I was supposed to get um, uh, what do they call it um, when you go into the hospital and they put you in they keep you in inpatient I admitted did, uh, yeah admitted okay we'll go with that I, I lose words. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was supposed to be admitted for my stem cell transplant. I was going to be there uh, 19 days. Mm-hmm. Um, so we we get there and we're waiting in the lobby for them to get my room ready. Yeah. And uh, finally, after a little while, the uh, nurse comes over to Mike and she says, now, honestly, Mike is only 13 years older than me. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> uh-huh. But uh, she comes over and she looks at him. And she goes, sir, your son's room is ready. Yeah. <laughs> And Mike said, I'm sorry. And I went, could you say that again? And she said, oh, I told your father your room is ready. And I just started laughing my ass off. <laughs> um, but, of course, that was a false alarm because uh, I ended up with an infection and I had to come home. And he had to bring me up again mm-hmm. when they finally – so that was like two months later. Mm. But, uh, yeah, so, you know, I got a big soft spot for Mike Peck in my life. Um. Yeah, he's like my dad. Yeah, I mean, when you dad. say that, uh, you know, we're like family at HRP, you know, you really mean it, and you've really, it really well, is like that. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Some of my uh, closest friends are people that worked with me here at HRP. Mm-hmm. I have this group of uh, of buddies. Uh, we go out to breakfast occasionally. We all. Well, they all worked here in the past. Mm-hmm. I'm the only one still here, but because uh, you're the sustainer, <laughs> I just—I I guess I'm just lazy. I won't leave. <laughs> um, 
But at some point, you're going to find me just, you know, curled up in a ball in the corner, and then yeah, we'll have the cleaning company take me out. But uh, you mean so, eventually, or like later tonight? No, not not it tonight. No, I have things to do. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I actually have to go back to work after this, so I'm mm-hmm. I'm only going to have one or three. <laughs> anyway, um, but that's what I was saying is, yeah, it is a family, especially to me. Um, mm-hmm. it, it's always been kind of a family, you know. Um. So my buddies, uh, you know, there's uh, guys from 25 years ago. There's 30 years ago. These are people that worked at HRP that long ago, and you know, we're still really close. Like my one of my best friends, literally was working with us in 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 uh, New Britain in 1987 as an intern uh, in the engineering, you know, for uh, Mark Pasanento. Um but we got this little group, and uh, we're all, you know, in our 50s or older now, uh, and we call it uh, MOCA, uh, a Men of a Certain Age. Uh-huh. That's the name of our, our breakfast group. So, uh, actually, we got one next Saturday. But, uh, yeah, so it's family. Um, like I said, most of uh, my close friends I, I met through HRP, and, and I mean, there's still people here I'm I'm pretty close to, you know. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's it's my family, and I like to impart that to new people when they come in. I, like I always like to say, "Welcome to the family. Welcome to the HRP family," because I honestly like that's what it is. It's it's a family. Mm-hmm. It's kind of a, a family business. I mean, look yep. at you. I know. Uh, <laughs> you know, like you were here the day after you were born. Yeah. <laughs> I'm talking about somebody can't get rid of. <laughs> Here, take this. Okay. Oh, you got me. I got you, buddy. Focus. Okay. Oh yeah, it's focusing on your eyeballs. Um, good. So, what uh got you interested in kind of helping out with what I'm working on here? Work, uh, like a lot of the uh, regional offices, they're doing a lot of their own figures now. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was my workload wasn't as heavy. Mm-hmm. Um, and things, we can do things a lot quicker now with, uh, with computers Yeah. than we used to. Um, we have a lot of templates that we can use that, you know, we can knock stuff out a lot quicker. So it basically, uh, came down to, um, I, I wanted to continue to, um, help the company move forward. Mm-hmm. Like I want to stay busy yeah. helping, you know what I mean? That's kind of my gig. I don't want to just like sit there i want to be busy mm-hmm. i figured if you guys can use the help why not help yeah um you know i'm hoping that i'll be able to you know assist you in anything you need mm-hmm. so yeah did you uh uh kind of like videography or photography or did you have any interest in that before i actually um i actually took the photos at a couple of uh, friends' weddings mm-hmm. um, used to have a pretty nice uh, SLR, but that was, like I said, twenty five years ago. I, I'm I'm like the king of the selfie before they were like selfies before digital cameras. Mm-hmm. But uh, no, I I just yeah. I mean, I, I I'd love to. I'd like maps. Yeah. So, like, some of the things that you and I have been talking about, like, we're, with the drone and everything, mm-hmm. and, and I'm looking at uh, I'm looking at all these maps. I, I like stuff like that, you know? Yeah. So, I'm looking forward to, you know, getting into the drone, um, you know, operating, and that's, uh, that's going to be pretty cool. Mm-hmm. We're going to keep passing this camera back and forth in the comments. Let us know uh, who uh, is doing it the best. Um <laughs> So who's doing it the best? I kind of have it like cocked to the side, so like I can make eye contact with you, and the camera's kind of like in. Oh, oh, gotcha. yeah, like off the side, like interview style kind of thing. Fancy, but you know, you do you. You, you know, what you feel looks good. Just make sure you know I'm in oh, no, focus. You're, prominent, you're prominently displayed there, Tom. Is the are the are the whites bounced? They're on your eyes. Not a, no, no. The the like the white bounce. Do I look like blown out? No, you don't look blown out. Okay, I've been putting on the pounds you. lately. <laughs> really? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you need to stop that. Um, Is there a slimming feature on this camera? I wish. Got to get the right lens. 
But yeah, it's very cool to uh, have that drone up there and be able to see um, from like a bird's eye view or perspective what the area around you looks like. Um, what I really want to do is get uh, FPV drones going. Do you know what those are? I do not. That's a first person view on the oh, drone. Oh, just have like yeah, this yeah. like bug looking pair of goggles that you put on, and uh, you, it feels like you're actually flying the thing around my neighbor um so about two years ago uh, a younger couple moved in next door to me mm-hmm. uh, they're both in their like oh, they're both in their early like i late 20s early 30s and uh they actually put in a uh skateboard half pipe uh-huh. in the backyard yeah which is pretty cool mm-hmm. so they both um when I finally, you know, got to, like, talk to them and stuff, they both work at ESPN. And uh, so he's a skateboarder, and he knows a bunch of the um, professional, the guy, the professional skateboarders. And um, so, like, he would have buddies come over, and they'd be in the half pipe. Mm-hmm. So they had, uh, they got married probably about six months ago. And they had a Jack and Jill in the backyard. And um, it was like a whole bunch of people were there. And they had a guy from ESPN that does drone work for ESPN. And so they had a few people were in the half pipe. Mm -hmm. And this guy was sitting there at at the table with the VR headset on. And there's this little drone flying around. And he's taking video of of like like the whole party, Mm -hmm. right? And it was a big tent, and he was, like, coming in under the tent. And, but he was, like, as people were going up and down the half pipe, he was, like, going in between them and rotating around. It was, like, totally fascinating watching <laughs> him do that. And he's just, like, sitting there, like, barely moving. And and he's got this drone, like, going in between skateboarders and stuff. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, like that, when I saw that, I was, like, that's pretty cool. I'd love to do something like that, you yeah. know. I'm I'd probably end up killing someone, but <laughs> yeah. So that that was really wild. So then when I found out we had a drone, I, I was like, I want to I want to learn how to fly that. Mm-hmm. You know. Do you so, have your uh, your test scheduled? I did not schedule it yet. Okay. I have to schedule it. How are you how are you progressing in your your studies? Pretty good. I'm yeah. uh, I'm like three quarters of the way through that course. Uh huh. Um, and I'm pretty confident. Mm-hmm. That I've got everything down so far. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah, you know, I, I was having some, if you don't stay on top of it, mm-hmm. you can lose it. Yeah. So, like, it was nice to get a refresher on, like, the METARs, mm-hmm. stuff like that. This is the Part 107 uh, FAA licensure for yeah. commercial drone piloting. So, it's yeah, it's it's some... Really, it's and what's cool about that is like you literally have to learn a lot of stuff that a manned aircraft pilot would have to learn. Mm-hmm. You know, so uh, that's that's some wild stuff. Mm. I'm looking forward to you know taking the test, passing it, and uh, yeah, playing around with that drone. I want to play around with that drone some. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I actually it was uh, ask. I was going to ask you. I think I. Sent you a team, so I I have mask beard. Pardon the mask beard, <laughs> uh, but I was going to ask uh, if we're going to uh, put the cages on the propellers. Does that change the weight significantly? No, um, it will probably put it over the limit for uh, because the way the FAA uh, regulates recreational versus commercial drones and what you need a licensure to fly faa regulates it as by weight yeah. but even mm-hmm. if it is uh over that weight you would need a license or rather you need it registered to uh fly it okay so when you put other modifications on it say the propeller guards or um maybe a like a gopro or something to get better video quality depending on the drone that you have mm-hmm you're now putting it above a weight limit where you need to meet certain requirements to fly it legally. Yeah, I figured that would make a difference, uh, you know. Mm-hmm. So what are you working today? What do you got there? For beer? Yes. Today we have 
Electric Dove, which is from Skygazer. All right, I'm going to try to focus on this one. A really uh, nice brewery over here in Connecticut. I'm trying to remember exactly where they're located. I think uh, this says North Haven on it, but I remember them being in like the Southington area. But they mostly do uh, sours. And that kind of style, like Berliner Weisses and things like that. And this one is blackberry, banana, and peanut butter, which seems kind of like weird, but tastes delicious. I think it's, this is fantastic. Yeah, it's like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Yeah, it kind of is. You know? In a good way. Yeah. It's not bad at all. I'm having the same, so. Mm-hmm. And I also brought one of these Italian beers, just in case I needed another. Mm-hmm. Fancy stuff. Litte. It's got to be Italian. I wasn't getting good focus on that. <laughs> Here, pass there. Go. We'll get a little. It says storing. Did I not record that? No, that bunch? was storing. Yeah, that's that was recording. That's, oh, that's what it does? Yeah. Are you going to get in on that? Yeah. It's like fragile, except it's litte. Well, I think we could probably wrap it up there too exciting huh yeah it was a, yeah, a whole lot of excitement there uh-huh all right well so, we're not here to like we've we've had our work hard week and now we're just here yeah to chill yeah. yeah absolutely and now i gotta go back and work hard yeah again get back in there but that's what 312 was all about mm-hmm. back in the day that's what that's how it started yeah. you know you went uh at 312 walk across the street to J. Timothy's in Plainville, have one beer, and then go back to work. Mm. It was just an attitude adjustment. Mm-hmm. So we've all evolved. But, uh, yep, yeah, I'm going to do a traditional 312 today, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> all right, everybody out there, thank you so much for joining us today. Make sure to like and subscribe. Hit the bell for notifications. If you are on the audio-only section of the podcast, make sure to subscribe to the pod. Make sure to leave us a review. That always helps us out a lot. And stay safe out there, everyone. Bye. Take care.